Hey, this is Pastor Allen. I'm the lead pastor here at First Baptist Church of Naples, and we are so happy that you have chosen to join us as we go through God's Word together. God's doing some amazing things here, and we pray that God's Word will transform you from the inside out. Our mission here is to glorify God by making disciples of Jesus Christ of all peoples. And our hope is, is that you are being a disciple that makes disciples. Now, if you don't have a church home, we would love for you to join us either in person or continuing online as we go into God's Word together every week. But if you are uh, a member of another church, we don't want this to be in any way, shape, form, or fashion a substitute uh, for you being connected to your local body. So our prayer is, is that God uses His Word to change you and to change others. So we pray that God will use you and this message for His glory. Have a great day. Matthew chapter 6 is where we're going to be. Matthew 6, and we're going to begin in verse number 9. And I know you just stood, but we're going to stand again to get our aerobics in this morning. Um, Chapter 6, verse 9, we get to the prayer. Let's read it, and then I'm going to read verses 14 and 15. Jesus says to us, pray then like this all together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Jesus says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. You may be seated. How many of you like owing people money? Yeah, me neither. All right, one guy in the back. <clears throat> we live in a nation of debtors. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, our national debt right now is $30 trillion and growing. Uh, Americans have over $15.24 trillion in consumer debt. Uh, that consumer debt is wrapped up in mortgages, uh, auto loans, credit cards, student loans. The average credit card Debt in the state of Florida is $8,444. It's 12th nationally. The average car payment in Florida for a new car is around $554 a month, although down in South Florida, it's probably way more than that. This morning, I was driving to church, and I had two guys had to be in their 60s or 70s driving right next to me in Ferraris. I doubt they have a car payment. The overall average debt of most Americans aged 35 to 55 is $135,000. 78% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. The average college graduate has $40,000 in student loans. 56 million adults are struggling to pay medical bills, and medical debt is the number one reason Americans file for bankruptcy. Psychologists say that debt brings about depression, high anxiety, fear, shame, guilt, and embarrassment. Now, you say, why are you bringing all this up? Well, today we're gonna talk about debt, but a different kind of debt, a debt of sin, and how you and I can be forgiven and how we can forgive others. See, we've been going through the Lord's Prayer, and the Lord's Prayer is the prayer of prayers taught by the King of Kings. And what we have learned is that it's very God-centered. Uh, And when you and I have the right perspective in our prayer life, we pray the right prayers. And so every phrase uh, that we've been walking through is filled with deep biblical truth, but it also assumes a lot of biblical knowledge. And so uh, as we've been going line upon line through this, we have learned that there is much more than what meets the eye in each one of these phrases. And so today, like the rest, we're going to be looking at this phrase, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And that phrase points us to the fundamental need that all of us have in this room and all of you watching online. The fundamental need of every human is a right relationship with God. Second to that is a right relationship with other people. And so to pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, here's what we're learning today in the message. That when we pray that, we are acknowledging the forgiveness that we need to get from God and the forgiveness that we need to give to others. Today's message is about there's a forgiveness that I need to get from God, but there's also a forgiveness that I need to give to others. So let's just unpack that. We'll be here for the next four hours and then we'll go home. Number one, the forgiveness we need to get. 
Verse 11 starts a sentence in the prayer, a new sentence. It says, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. This word and is a conjunction. Conjunction, junction, what's your function? Well, it's connecting here. And so what we're learning here is there is a connection between daily bread and asking for forgiveness. Now, what is that? And that is this idea of having a daily need for it. Just as we need daily bread, we need daily forgiveness. Uh, We need bread so that we may live and we need forgiveness so that we may not die. Our daily needs are both physical uh, and spiritual. Uh, We need daily forgiveness because we sin every day. We sin every hour. We sin every minute. Some of you are sinning right now. Sin is both a real and present danger in our daily lives. And so Jesus says that when you are to pray, just as you ask for daily bread, ask for daily forgiveness. And so he says, forgive us our debts. Now, some of you, as we've been going through this series, when when we get to reading this out loud, you you say, I don't like saying the word debts. I like, I was used to saying the word trespass or trespasses. And, and, and I want to kind of give you the reason why that maybe there's a difference. If, if you grew up Anglican and the Episcopal Church, if you grew up a Roman Catholic or you grew up Methodist, uh, a lot of those churches, um, this word trespass actually comes out of the Book of Common Prayer. And so people from those religious backgrounds are used to, when they talk about the Lord's Prayer, use the word trespass. Normally the popular uh, way, that, like I said, the Book of Common Prayer, the popular way is, uh, uses the word trespass. The word trespass is not a bad word. It's a, it's a good word. It's, it's a word here that means to violate a command. If you think about trespassing, uh, it's crossing a line into a territory that doesn't belong to you. Uh, and so that's a word, and it's a word that can mean sin. But the word debt suggests something different, actually something a little bit, I think, deeper. And that the, the word debt um, suggests that we owe something. We owe something either monetarily or non-monetarily. So, so, so when, when you have done something against God or you've done something against someone else, you are accumulating a debt. Now, what's the difference? Or which one's right, which one's wrong? Well, I don't want you to leave here thinking that if you've been saying trespasses and for years that you were evil and wrong. No, but the word here that Jesus is using in the Greek is the word debt and debtors. Jesus is specifically using this language debt and debtors to show the seriousness of our offense. See, when we think of the word debt and and our modern Western mindset, we see it as either A, an inevitable evil, two, uh, B, to B, whatever, uh, or not to B, um, a savvy business plan, or we see it as an annoyance, or some of us is just, we can't afford stuff, so we have to use it to get what we really want. But in Jesus's day, debt was something that could cause you to get into serious trouble, that it uh, could come into a punishable prison sentence for those who had debt but couldn't repay. And so in Jesus's day, um, a lot of people that were in prison were in debtor's prison. In the the Roman period in, in Jesus's day, that's the majority of the people that were in jail. They got into a debt that they couldn't repay. And so those who went long enough, either some of them were executed for it or others were sold into slavery. And so people who had a debt they couldn't repay were put into prison until they paid the debt that they were owed. And so it doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, why why would you put somebody in prison uh, for not paying a debt, but then they really can't do anything to pay their debt in prison. And so what their thought was is this, the system was, is that this would put pressure on the family to find money to pay their loved one out of prison. And so in Jesus's day, and there was a time frame with that. So in Jesus's day, Debt was a matter of life or death. And so again, maybe you remember this parable, this story that Jesus told about this guy who uh, who, uh, owed a king like 10,000 talents, like some astronomical number. And the king was going through his records and says, ah, here's this guy, he owes me all kinds of money. I'm just gonna forgive him. And so the guy forgives the guy of his debt. And so this guy is like, he's so happy, he's debt free. He just called Dave Ramsey and on the show said, I'm debt free. He's so excited. Then he sees this dude that owes him like a hundred bucks. And the guy says, I don't have any money. And so the guy says, well, you're gonna go to prison until you pay it to me. And so that's kind of where this comes from, this whole mindset. 
But here's even deeper. When, we, when the Bible talks about sin, sin needs to be thought more than just crossing a line. Sin is a debt. See, when someone wrongs you, in the ledger of your mind, a debt is established. So if somebody has done you dirty, someone has done you wrong, there's a debt that that person owes you and they have to pay for what they have done. So for example, let's say you're driving in Naples and, and someone, their fault, runs into your car, which isn't an unheard of thing here. And so they wrecked your car, they broke it, they're now responsible. There's a debt now. And so you could sue them for damage. You call Morgan and Morgan and, and, and he's for the people and then you can sue and get damages, right? Because they, they broke it, they bought it, right? So when you, when you and I are asking God to forgive us, what are we asking for? We're asking God to absorb the cost. So again, going to that illustration, if someone runs into you and they say, I don't have any insurance and I'm broke, then they're basically, if you want your car fixed, you gotta absorb the cost to fix the car yourself. Well, when we come to God and we ask God to forgive us, we're saying, God, I want you to absorb the cost and I want you to bear the payment of my sin yourself. I'll give you another illustration. Let's say somebody comes up to me after the end of the service and says, Pastor, I need $500. And so I give them $500. I loan them $500. As a matter of fact, let me just give you some advice. If, anybody, if a family member or friend ever needs to borrow money from you, and you give it to them, just, a, just a, in your mind, it's a gift, all right? It's a gift. Just in your mind, say, I'll never see this again. That'll save you a lot of headaches, a lot of heartache, right? If you get it back, praise God. If you don't get it back, you've not lost a friend or family member, okay? And so if somebody comes to me and they borrowed $500 and I give it to them and they say, I'm gonna pay you back next week. And so uh, next week comes, I can't find them. The FBI can't find them. Nobody can find them. Two weeks later, I see them at Walmart. They're ducking and weaving, but finally I get them in a corner there in the shampoo aisle. And there they are. And they say, hey, I pay me. I can, you know, you kind of that awkward. They know, you know, everybody knows. And they say, hey, look, preacher, we're having a really rough time right now. Can you, can you forgive me? If I say yes, how much does it cost me? $500. See, I heard of somebody, Saturday, they couldn't even figure it out. <laughs> like, they, like they, they didn't even know. 9.30, we're pretty good. You guys, hey, we had two or three of you. So that's great. That's good. <laughs> Proud of you. Here's what you have to understand. Forgiveness is never free. It always costs. To forgive someone, whether it's monetarily or morally, it's never free, it always costs. And so when it comes to God, asking God to forgive you is asking God to pay the cost, to absorb the cost. So we sin against God and we want him to pay. But here's the problem and here's the issue. Our debt of sin against God is infinite. And therefore it requires an infinite payment. And so the only way that God can forgive us is to bear on himself our debt. And so God the Father sent God the Son to take our punishment so we could pay our debt. Now, a lot of people, many people in our day assume forgiveness is just something that they're entitled to, that they kind of expect forgiveness. So like the motto of our day, don't ask for permission, ask for forgiveness because you're going to get it. And so a lot of people in our day take it for granted. But here's what you got to understand. We are not entitled to nor deserving of God's forgiveness. And yet forgiveness is the only way that we can stand in God's presence without being a crispy critter, okay? It's the only way. Forgiveness, therefore, is not earned, it's given. That's what we need. We need, in our daily lives, for God to absorb. So you say, preacher, you know what? I'm saved, I'm a Christian, my sins are forgiven. I Ask Jesus to save me. I've surrendered my life to him. Why is it that Jesus in this text is just as I ask for daily bread, why is it that I'm to ask God for daily forgiveness? Well, there are two types of forgiveness when it comes to God. The first kind of forgiveness is legal forgiveness. This is judicial forgiveness. That when you come to God and you ask for salvation, you ask for forgiveness of all your sins, you uh, are then granted that forgiveness. And that forgiveness is that you are forgiven from the penalty of sin, which is hell for eternity. So at salvation, at 
The moment that you trusted Christ as your Savior, you were legally and totally forgiven of all sins, past sins, present sins, future sins. There is no double jeopardy and there is no condemnation. You are no longer will you ever be under the penalty of sin. You are legally once for all forgiven before a holy God. Amen. That's the first kind of forgiveness, the legal forgiveness. But the second is relational forgiveness. Now, when it comes to God, think of it as parental forgiveness. So you can be forgiven legally, but still there's a barrier between you. So you can have a relationship with someone, a legal relationship with someone, and yet you and that other person may have something between you. You may not be in fellowship. There may be some sort of barrier that's keeping you from enjoying each other's company. And so the same is true with God. God is not just your judge. God is your father. And since even though you have been declared legally free and your status before God is secure because of what Jesus did, you and I can still disobey. We can still sin against God. And therefore, there's a barrier between us. I mean, how many of you, you have to raise your hand. How many of you, since you become a Christian, have sinned against God? All of us. And, the, and if you don't acknowledge that, you're a liar, which is sinning against God. <laughs> and because you sin against God, there's a barrier. You're not in harmony. You're not in fellowship. I think the best way to illustrate this is with your kids. Your kids, those of you who have kids in the room, are legally yours on their worst day. When you want to get rid of them, you can't legally because they're yours at birth. But just because they are legally yours and you are in a legal relationship with them doesn't mean that you like them all the time. I mean, how many of you that had kids in the car lost your religion coming to church? <laughs> you know, some of y'all said, you know, some, some of you, one of your husband said, said to your wife, you know what, hey, hey honey, you go get the kids ready for church. I'll wait in the car and honk the horn. I mean, we have this. I mean, listen, this happens. And so as much as you love your kids, they aggravate you, right? They sin against you. They frustrate you. They disobey you, right? And so there can be a wedge in between you and them. Even though legally they are your kids, you can't get rid of them easily, They are yours. But then there's a barrier. But yet when your kid comes to you and they realize what they've done against you and they say, I'm sorry, mommy, daddy, I'm sorry. Then that barrier is removed. That's what we're talking about here. Legally yours, but relationally there can be a barrier. See, most people, even some of you in the church, you don't know how to relate to God as father. You only relate to God as a judge. And if God is just a judge, then in your mind, it's either innocent or guilty. And so you'll live your life not at rest, not with any satisfaction, because it's really not a relationship, it's a transaction. And so constantly, every day, you're worried, well, did I sin enough today to go to hell? And so, you know, what's the judge gonna do? And so if you live your life that way, you don't have any peace. And here's the thing, if you only relate to God as a judge, you're never gonna think of pleasing or displeasing. Again, you're just gonna think in terms of guilt and innocence. But here's what you gotta understand. Your relationship with God is not just a legal standing, it is a living relationship. And so you will never lose your legal status. Even when you sin, you will always be a child of God, a joint heir with Jesus. There is no condemnation to you. But yet, when you do sin, you displease the Lord. And here's the deal. If you relate to God only as a judge, nobody who just got acquitted by a judge goes back to the judge and says, you know, I'm sorry, I committed another crime. Just wanted you to know. No, you, you just, you keep trying to hide it. But when you, when you go to your father and you tell him that you sinned against him, that he forgives. See, God is displeased when we sin, but he's pleased when we repent. He wants us to repent. Uh, Richard Sibbs, the Puritan, said that there is more mercy in Christ than there is sin in me. One of my favorite verses is 1 John 1, 9. As a matter of fact, I love it so much, I want to hear you say it with me. 
1 John 1, 9. Let's all do it together. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That word confess is the Greek word homo legei. I know they didn't do anything for you, but it means to say the same word. And so when you confess to God, you are saying to God the same word that God would say about your sin. So when you pr- confess your sins, you're not informing God. God already knows. It's not like, you know, when you tell God, hey, I'm sorry I did this. He's like, man, Gabriel, I didn't know Alan did that. Did you know he did that? No, nobody knew. Listen, that when you confess, you're not informing God doodly squat. What you're doing is you're acknowledging what you did and how it offended God. Real confession is specific, it's not general. How many of you love apologies that start out this way? If I've offended you. Well, you have, with that apology. If I've offended you, I'm sorry. No, true confession may start general, but gets specific. Why? Because that will tell you that the Holy Spirit is working inside of you. Satan will accuse you generally. He'll accuse you of all kinds of general things. The Holy Spirit will convict you specifically. And so he'll point out to you areas. I mean, have you ever messed up or sinned against someone or did something wrong? And you said, man, I shouldn't have done that. And you just felt that conviction of the Holy Spirit. That's what that is. And here's the thing. You can either deal with it or you can hide from it. But here's what you have to understand. If you try to hide your sin, it will always get you. And it will, you'll be in bondage to it. There's some of you right now, you are hiding in your sin. Your sin is attached to a screen. Your sin is attached to a relationship. Your sin is attached to some addiction. And here's what you have to understand. Sin loses its power when it's exposed. But as long as it's in hiding, it's your master. As long as it's lurking around in your life, it's telling and calling the shots. But when you expose it, you are releasing yourself from the bondage of your sin. See, the more you confess it, the faster you confess it, the more you grow, the more you change, the more there's deep humility and joy towards God and a hatred of sin. So confession is not blame shifting. I mean, people shift blame. They want to justify their actions. They want to blame it on somebody else. Well, it's this person that caused me to do that, or it's that person that caused me to do this, or this situation. I mean, it's the blame game. I mean, the blame game is as old as Adam and Eve. Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed the snake, and the snake didn't have a leg to stand on. I mean, this is old stuff here. It's the blame game. But here, confession is not the blame game, but it's also not self-pity. See, when you and I feel bad about our consequences, the the circumstances about our sin, and not concerned about offending a holy God, that's self-pity. You know, most people, even godly people, worry more about what sin does to us, how it affects us, then how it affects others in God. Most people, their they're sorry is this, I'm sorry I got caught. Or, other, or I will do whatever I have to do and say whatever I have to say to get less severe consequences for my actions. Well, well that's not repentance. That's not confession. That's It's not blame shifting. It's not self-pity. It's repentance. It's it's acknowledgement and turning to. Martin Luther said that the Christian life is a life of repentance. Charles Simeon said that confession and repentance is growing downward. Humbling ourselves again and again before the Lord so that we will be brought nearer and nearer to the foot of the cross. But here he said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful. The Greek's literally faithful as he. He is faithful to us when we're not faithful to him. Listen, when you and I understand that we are loved and accepted in spite of our sin, it should make us want to admit our flaws and our faults. When you know you're loved and you're accepted, even when you're unfaithful, he remains faithful. You can come to him and he's not only faithful, but he's just. At the cross, God justly dealt with your sin once for all. God paid the debt of your sin without destroying you for eternity. So when you say the same thing to God, when you confess your sins, you can trust that God will forgive you because he will not deny you based on what Jesus has already done for you. You know that if you come to God, he is not going to say no soup for you. He is not going to be repelled by you, but he's going to be compelled towards you because he is faithful and he is just. It would be very unjust if God wouldn't forgive you if you genuinely confess to him. Why? Because he's promised in his word that if you confess, he'll forgive. 
J.D. Greer says that confession grows out of our love for Jesus because the more we understand the depth of our sin, the more we appreciate the height of his love. I hate cancer. Why do I hate cancer? Why does anyone hate cancer? Because of what it does to the person we love. My uncle Tony had stage four, grade four glioblastoma in his brain. A man who was one of the most, one of the strongest men I've ever knew became one of the weakest men I ever knew. Destroyed his life, ravaged his body. Many of you have felt the pain of cancer personally. Why do I bring that up? It's because that's what sin does. Sin is far worse than cancer. It affects the people that we love. See, when we love God more, we learn to hate our sin because of what it does and how it offends God. The same is true in your personal life with other people. When you sin against other people, you're hurting them. And when you understand how much you're hurting God and how much you're hurting people, then you'll stop blaming others, how much you're offending God and how much you're hurting people. You'll stop blaming others for your problems. You'll stop feeling sorry for yourself and you'll see that your sin hurts those you love and it offends the God above. See, when you understand that sin hurts those you love and hurts the God above who loves you, it will help you come to God, ask him to forgive you and to stop doing what is causing so much damage. It's a forgiveness that we need. We all need it. But secondly, not only is there forgiveness that we need to get, but there's a forgiveness that we need to give. It would be really great if all that sermon was, forgive us our debts. But then Jesus has to go from preaching to meddling. Notice what he says here. Forgive us our debts, comma, as we also have forgiven our debtors. That's almost a scandalous request. Here's what it's saying. God, follow my example. Father, forgive me as I'm forgiving others. In other words, treat me as I'm treating other people. Here's the question for all of us. Do you and I feel confident enough to ask God to treat us like we treat other people? I mean, do you feel that confident? Jesus gives commentary in verses 14 and 15, and it's very confusing to some people. It, it seems like it reads this way. If you forgive others, you'll be forgiven. If you don't forgive others, you won't be forgiven. Well, here's what Jesus is teaching. I'll tell you what he is teaching by teaching what he's not teaching. Jesus here is not teaching that you and I earn forgiveness through forgiveness. We're not forgiven because we forgive, but we forgive because we're forgiven. Believers are expected to forgive. Why? Because they have been forgiven. And if you refuse to forgive people, if you never forgive people, if you always keep a list of accounts, if you're constantly upset and bitter over what people have done for you for years, it, it may need be a great opportunity for you to wonder if you've ever been forgiven. See, when you forgive someone, you're saying, I'm not gonna make you pay the payment that I think is mine. That when you forgive someone, you're, forgo you're forgoing the debt of others to you because of the debt that has been forgiven by God. Some of you have been hurt. Some of you, listen, I, I, there's no way I can get everything in this message and we couldn't take it, none of us could. But here's how I wanna help some of you that have been either sinned against or you've sinned. Please listen to this. Every sin, every sin will either be paid for by the cross of Jesus or hell for eternity. Every sin must be paid for, every sin. Every sin that has been done against you or that you've done to others will either be paid for by the cross of Jesus or hell for eternity. And if you have been forgiven by Jesus at the cross, that should fundamentally change how you think of other people. Jesus, or pardon me, Paul talks about this to the church of Ephesus in Ephesians 4.31. He says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from among you along with all malice. And then he says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God for Christ's sake forgave you. See how we have been forgiven should impact how we forgive others. Now, some of you say, well, preacher, that's all great, but, but I don't really understand forgiveness. Well, let me just give you a couple things here. I wanna give you two things that forgiveness is not. 
Number one, forgiveness is not the absence of consequences. There are consequences that come as a result of sin. Even the thief on the cross who Jesus forgave died on the cross next to Jesus for crimes he committed. So just because you forgive someone doesn't mean that there will not be bad consequences to their actions. Some of you have been in abusive situations. Some of you have been wrong very uh, badly. You, you, have, you have been swindled. Uh, some of you are in, have been in marriages where there's domestic abuse. Some of you right now are in marriages of domestic abuse. And, and, and you, you're hearing a message on forgiveness and you say, okay, I need to forgive them. I want to be a good Christian. But listen to me. You can forgive and still call the cops. Somebody need to hear that this morning. And there she is right there. You can forgive and still call the cops. Forgiveness is not the absence of consequences and forgiveness is not the absence of judgment. Jesus in Matthew 7 is gonna teach two things. One, don't judge others. People love that verse. Secondly, do not cast pearls before pigs. Now, how do those two things interact with each other? Well, listen, to not cast pearls before pigs means that you have to judge whether or not someone is a pig. Let that one sink in. Jesus here was talking when he says do not judge about having a harsh spirit of criticism and judgmentalism that assumes and thinks the worst of people. Don't run around like that. Sadly, a lot of Baptists, that's their MO. They make a list, check it twice. They criticize, they're not, they're not happy, and they assume the worst. Jesus says, don't be like that. But Jesus is teaching about pearls before the swine is he's teaching us that we need to make spiritual analysis. We need to have spiritual discernment. There are times that we need to use wise discernment in dealing with people. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. So forgiveness is not the absence of consequences. Forgiveness is not the absence of judgment. Forgiveness is also not seeking revenge. It's not seeking payment. That's what it's not. It's not being like Anigo Montoya in The Princess Bride who said, you killed my father, prepare to die. No. It is a refusal to retaliate. That's what forgiveness is. It's a refusal. And you'll never be more like Jesus than when you refuse to retaliate. It's refusing to make someone pay. It's absorbing the debt. Now, again, just because you forgive doesn't mean that there are not consequences for that person. And just because you forgive does not mean that you trust them and you become best friends again. But when you forgive, you set the other person free, but more importantly, you set yourself free from the bondage of bitterness. Someone said this, I don't know who it was, but here's what he said, or she said. Unforgiveness is taking poison and expecting someone else to die. See, forgiveness is an act of the will. Whether or not it comes immediately, if ever, with a corresponding feeling. See, we are not to forgive because we always feel like forgiving in the moment. Often we don't feel like forgiving. Often, you know what we want? We want revenge. Someone has caused a debt. We want revenge. We want justice. We want someone to suffer for what they have done to us. You know the truth? When we've been hurt, we want justice. When we've hurt somebody else, we want grace. But here's what you have to understand. If we wait for our feelings to change towards a person to feel like forgiving them, we may never do it. Dr. Ann, who is our counselor, one of our counselors here on staff, her and I, she and I were talking about this, uh, this message this week. And one of the things she said that I really appreciated was this. She said, don't trust your feelings because they are very fickle. It's true, right? Sometimes you feel like a nut. Sometimes you don't. 
Almond joys have mounds, or nuts, and mounds don't. I mean, if you lived your life based on how you felt, that wouldn't be good. But what, what she and I both talked about is that feelings often follow actions. You may not feel like forgiving, but when you start forgiving, it may change how you feel. Jesus says, listen, when you're praying this prayer, you're, you're saying, God, forgive me as I'm forgiving others. That's a tall order but you and I should aspire to forgive others. And you and I should aspire to forgive others as God has forgiven us. Just as we ask God to forgive as we've forgiven, we really need to be asking God, forgive as you, help us to forgive others as you've forgiven us. How has God forgiven you? Well, number one, he's forgiven you freely. No one makes him forgive you. Secondly, he's forgiven you fully, totally, complete. And he's also forgiven you forever. He, he, he forgives and he forgets. Now, it's not that our sin is no longer in his memory. God is omniscient. So he, he knows everything. He knows everything that will happen. And he also, he also knows everything that could happen. So he knows where you're going to go to lunch today. But he also knows where you could have gone to lunch today. But when it says that he forgets, when the Bible talks about that, when he separates your sin as far as the east is from the west, when he talks about that, what it means is this, is it's no longer in his books. It's no longer in his account. On the ledger, it's clean. No longer is there a debt that stands against you. He's not reminded of it, and he doesn't remind us of it. He doesn't hold it against us anymore. He doesn't bring it up again. That's how he treats us. Listen, you and I will only be able to forgive when we understand the truth of the gospel. Jesus on the cross, what did he pray? You remember what he prayed? Father, forgive them. Wow. No one will ever sin against you more than you've sinned against God. And if God can forgive me of the greatest offenses that I have offended him with, then why can I not be willing to forgive others? If I have been forgiven, I should be forgiving. And here's what you have to understand. Forgiveness is not easy, but it's possible because of Jesus. My wife reminded me of something that Nancy Guthrie said. She said, we are the most forgiven people. Christians are the most forgiven people. Therefore, we should be the most forgiving people. Corey Tim Boone was placed in a Nazi concentration camp in her early 40s. She was placed in there uh, because her and her family were hiding Jews and political dissidents in their house in Harlem. I've been to her house. I've been into the room that they built, the hiding place. Her father was arrested, detained, and in his detention, died of pneumonia. She and her sister Betsy were carted off to that horrible concentration camp in Ravensbrook, and there both Corey and Betsy were humiliated, they were tortured, they were abused, they were starved. Betsy succumbed to the environment, and she died. By the grace of God, Corey survived, and in 1947, she was speaking to a crowd about God's love and forgiveness in Europe. In the crowd that day was a former guard. This is a true story. Maybe you've heard this before. There was a guard that was one of her abusers that was there at her talk. After she talked about forgiveness, the man felt compelled, convicted to come down and see Corey. And so he walks towards Corey, and as he is standing there, she sees him. She knows who he is. He comes and he tells her, I have become a Christian. Then he extends his hand to Corey and says, do You forgive me. Here's what she says. She says, I had to take the man's hand. I knew that. 
The message that God forgives is a prior condition that we forgive those who have injured us. I told myself, I can lift my hand. I can do that much. But Jesus, you supply the feeling. And as I reached out my hand, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulders and raced down my arm and sprang into our joined hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother. I cried with all my heart. And for a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. And she says, I've never known God's love so intensely as I did then. Man is never more like God than when he or she forgives. And God is never more like God when he forgives. Here's my question as we end. Who do you need to forgive? Who do you need to forgive? Who is the number one person on the list of debtors in your life? You know, the past three years, our church has gone through a lot. Who do you need to forgive? The past two years of this pandemic, many of you have gone through difficulties, marriages, children, etc. Who do you need to forgive? And secondly, what do you need to be forgiven of? Today, you have an opportunity to receive forgiveness and to have a right relationship with God through Jesus. And today, you have the opportunity to forgive and you may say, Pastor, the person that I want to forgive is dead. Then ask God to give you the strength to forgive. You say, Pastor, the person that I need to forgive, what if I forgive them and they never repent? Forgive them anyway. And ask God to give you strength. But don't say, I'm too good. I don't need to be forgiven. And don't say, I'm too bad, I'm beyond God's forgiveness. Because we have a Savior who can save from the guttermost and save to the uttermost. And if you need to be forgiven, He's available. And if you need to forgive somebody, it's possible. Only through Jesus. Father, in Jesus' name, would your Holy Spirit do what I could not do? Would you call sinners to yourself? Will you help us today to forgive as we have been forgiven? But Lord, also, as we're taught in this prayer, to forgive as we have forgiven others. Lord, give us strength to forgive others the way you have forgiven us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and let's sing. Thank you for joining us as we go through God's word together. I pray again that God will transform you from the inside out. So as we say here at first, you have come to church, go out and be the church, have a great week of worship. We can't wait to see you soon.